So we're in Santa Ana, California, in Orange County, California, and we're meeting Gustavo Ariano, the great food writer as well as cultural critic. We're at Burritos La Palma, which is a great low-end burrito joint, and we're doing this partly to celebrate the legacy of Jonathan Gold, who is one of the classic Southern California food writers. And what is great about Gold is that he could enjoy food where he found it and as he found it. It's not just what's on the plate or in the in the wrapper. It's also, you know, the people who are making it, the, the air in the restaurant, everything like that. And uh, I think we're in for a real treat here. Gustavo, thanks for talking to us. Gracias as always, Nick. We are here for a somewhat somber occasion. The beloved LA Times and Southern California food critic, Jonathan Gold, has died recently. And he talked about this place, Burritos La Palma, as one of the best, five best burrito joints in Southern California. What was his take on this, and do you agree with that? I have to agree with it, because this burrito, it's a, inside is a meat called birria de res. So birria, usually in Mexico, is goat stew, but this is goat stew prepared with beef. And it's a specialty from the region of Mexico where my parents are from, uh, Jerez, Zacatecas, a city in, around the central state of Zacatecas. And up until Burrito La Palma opened a couple years ago, the only place you could get this food in Southern California were at Union Halls and Armenian churches whenever we'd have our quinceañeras oh. and weddings. Why Armenian churches? Because <laughs> Montebello, that's why. Okay. That's like the grand nexus. Anaheim and Montebello are the grand nexus for us, and Montebello had a lot of Armenians. So this was Birria de Res, you would only serve no other restaurant. Burrito La Palma starts serving it, immediately Jonathan comes, finds it so amazing that he ended up calling it one of his five best burritos. Why was Jonathan Gold such a good food critic? What, what was the quality of his insights or his sense of adventurism? What, what was it about him? He was a Southern California through and through. Jewish kid, grew up in South Central, grew up on the West Side, went to UCLA, go Bruins, married a Latina, worked for LA Weekly, and he was of an era where he was no, long, no longer gonna be hidebound by, oh, we're gonna stay on the West Side. You're East LA, oh, that's dangerous. He didn't care where the food was. Mm -hmm. He was gonna go find it. And more importantly, he didn't subscribe to this hoity-toity world of high-end food and low-end food. For him, food was food. If it's good, that's what matters. And more importantly, there's a story behind all this food. It's not just what you eat. I mean, already just talking about this burrito, I gave you stories about Mexican immigration, Armenian immigration. And again immigration. and again with your parents. Uh -huh. We get it, you're from Mexico, <laughs> right? And, uh, but. but also, um, talk a little bit about you. Yeah, he started at LA Weekly, so he's you know he ends up at the, at the LA Times. But what does it mean to come from you know LA if you're a uh, you know an East Coast establishment person, or you believe that DC and New York and Boston maybe dominate the world? What does it mean to come from LA? And then in LA, what does what does it mean to come from the LA Weekly as opposed to the LA Times? Historically, the LA Weekly was the alternative weekly of. Southern California. Jonathan started for them as a proofreader, and actually his first famous uh, stories were about uh, gangster rap. He wrote the definitive cover story on NWA. He had this great scene where Eazy E is in his mom's house in Compton, and they ask him, hey, did, you didn't bring the AK-47? He's like, no, this is my mom's house. Why would I do that? And then busts out like a big bag of just guns, and, and Jonathan described it. He looked like a Little League baseball coach right. uh, handing out uh, bats and gloves. But to be from the LA Weekly meant that you were not going to see the world like the LA Times, especially the LA Times in the 1980s, incredibly stiff, incredibly boring, incredibly, I mean, so thorough on all the superficial stuff. They cared too much about what New York thought about them. LA Weekly historically only cared about what Angelinos cared about them. And Jonathan came of that. And by the time he went to the LA Times, I, mean, I always thought his heart and soul really was at the LA Weekly in those old days. And so when he went to the LA Times, for me, it's like, well, he's bringing a little bit of LA Weekly to the LA Times. Heaven knows that paper uh, needed it. Your book, Taco USA, which was excerpted a few years ago in Reason. I wrote a cover. Uh, yeah. Briefly reprise for us, because we're, we're in a moment where we have a president who, uh, who started his successful campaign to become president by saying Mexico, Mexicans are rapists, they're drug dealers, they're disease carriers. You know, Mexico's not sending us our best. And some of and, them are good people. Yeah, yeah. well, he says he guessed, right? I yeah. guess some of them are good people. <laughs> you know, so we're there, but but Mexican food has taken over the U.S. It's it, what maybe Italian food or pizza was 30 or 40 years ago. Before that, maybe, uh, you know, kind of like German pub fare or something. Um, how does it feel to be a, a Mexican in Trump's America? Even with all the anti-Mexican rhetoric that Trump said, 
what was he eating for Cinco de Mayo at his hotel, at his desk, a taco salad. And right. everyone trashed him for eating that taco salad. But I said, that is proof that there is hope. Because if someone like Trump loves Mexican food, then anyone can. And if you first like the food, eventually you're gonna have to like the people. People want instantaneous change. It takes time. And so in my book, Taco USA, I, I talk about the evolution of Mexican food over the past 125 years. I talk about how the first uh, dispatches about Mexican food was that if you ate it, all these chilies, they would kill you. They literally yeah. would kill you. And now, I mean, there's more salsa. There's an entire sub channel on, on a cable package where all people do is eat ghost peppers. Or <laughs> yeah, something yeah, like that, yeah. right? Constantly. Yeah, yeah, so. the Carolina Reaper, yeah. <laughs> and which the habanero is the best. Yeah. No, the chile tapin is actually the best mm -hmm. spicy pepper of them all. It's a small little thing. But what we have now, salsa has outsold ketchup for 20, mm -hmm. over 25 years in the United States. There's more tequila sold in the United States than in Mexico. Americans love Mexican food. And eventually, if you have a, my theory and what I talk about in my book, if you have a generation that grows up on Mexican food, loving it, eventually they're going to be able to see Mexicans as human beings, which is an incredible accomplishment given that Mexico has been the ultimate arch enemy of the United States, what, 160 years now or something? I can't even remember. How do you feel about cultural appropriation in this <laughs> debate? And you know, one of the things that's interesting about your writing in general, and certainly in Taco USA, is you know the 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 starting assumption is there is only cultural appropriation. Yeah. Is it going to become more difficult to play around with food or to do fusion cuisine if you know we're in Orange County, you know when uh, and it's already happening, but when Vietnamese start doing Vietnamese tacos and you know and and Mexicans or Armenians or whoever start doing Vietnamese dishes, when we're being told increasingly or it seems to be that's that's bad form. Is is cuisine going to suffer? And if cuisine suffers, do race relations suffer? Hmm. This is a problem with my, how can I put this? This is a problem with the left when they start critiquing restaurants and restaurateurs for cultural appropriation. They don't know the restaurant industry. They do not know how food works. They don't know that the restaurant industry is the most rapacious, capitalistic industry ever created in mankind. This is the type of place where someone will rip off their mother's own recipe, but that means they can make a dollar more a month. So of course it's gonna happen, even with this burrito, this wasn't being made in restaurants until uh, Burrito La Palma started making it four years ago. Now all these little loncheras, all these little taco trucks are making birria de res, even if they're not from Zacatecas, because they know what sells. That's just on the money you know, right. standpoint. Uh, and then just on a creative standpoint, who are we to tell white people? I'm sorry to say this, you know, white people are fine sometimes, but now, who are do we? you consider yourself white? I mean, uh, you're, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like, you're, That's what I am. you're like whiter than I am. You're certainly, <laughs> my, uh, we're my, on the spectrum. My grandma had a green eyes, so that's, okay, so yeah. that's that part. Then my dad was straight indigenous <laughs> for, my, for my grandparents. But who are we to tell anyone you right. can't cook that food? In fact, if you come to Southern California, most of the restaurants, the chefs in the back, Mexicans are making sushi, Mexicans are making French food, Mexicans are making uh, you know, Vietnamese food. There's this great Vietnamese restaurant here in Little Saigon in Orange County. We have the largest population of Vietnamese in the world outside of Vietnam. But it's famous not just because it has great central Vietnamese cuisine, which is kind of rare around here, but this is the place where the Latino waiters and cooks, they speak better Vietnamese than the second generation Vietnamese Americans. And they're the ones who are teaching them about their cuisine. So are Mexicans racist for cooking that food? No. Are white people racist for trying to be rich, making off Mexican food? Absolutely not. So it's an easy tale for us to weep and moan on the left. Like, oh, white people, they're just making so much money off of us Mexicans. You know what? Mexicans are making a lot more money off of Mexican food than white folks are. This is why Mexican food has been as strong as it has been for 125 years. Nothing against Italian food. I love Italian food. Where's the fusion in Italian food? Besides, you know, the last time there was fusion in Italian food was when Marco Polo introduced uh, <laughs> noodles, and then of course Columbus brought over the tomatoes. But ever right. since then, or or if we're not going to insult the Italians, Germans. What was the last innovation in sauerkraut? Nothing. On the other hand, tacos are evolving again and again and again. This is what food, when food evolves, cultures stay strong. When foods, it, it, and people on the left, they want food to remain in this, in amber. But when yeah. you amberize, I don't even know if that's yeah. a word, but if you amberize food and culture, that's when they die. That's what they don't understand. What is the, but then what, I, I think you're absolutely right. And there becomes this cult of authenticity yes. where you can never change anything. And it's like, yeah, you know, people like change. What is the uh, uh, the analog on the right? Because the right, you know, and it is, it's, you know, there's something darkly and deeply ironic about Donald Trump hating Mexicans and then eating a taco a taco bowl every day and, and praising, like, I've got the best taco bowl in all of New York. <laughs> I love the Hispanics. Um, what is the right wing um, flip of the left fetish of kind of authenticity and staying stuck in time? 
The, the interesting thing is that the obvious reason, the obvious explanation is that they hate the ethnic food, and they used to. I mean, yeah. I mean, so many historically, one of the worst epithets you could hurl at a group was how they ate. So yeah, Mexicans yeah. become beaners. Yeah, you're a, a spaghetti bender. Spaghetti or bender, a, a that's macro, a classic. A macro snapper, yeah. Macro yeah, snapper, yeah, 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 for the Catholics and all that. Because what you're saying by that is your food's disgusting, and since if you eat that, you're not a human. You're a subhuman, so right. therefore we could genocide you or whatever. But you don't really see that. I mean, I heard someone call someone the other day somewhere a beaner, and like, really? <laughs> that's like from the 1950s. That's yeah. like, get behind the program. But I, but also at the same time, you do have the right fetishizing authentic. Like yeah. they'll start saying, oh, we want street tacos. Just the fetish of authenticity. It's something both conservatives and liberals hold to. The conservatives, they want this authentic experience. They want to see how the other side live because for them, the other side is lower than them. For the left, the other side, you have to you have to exalt them. Oh, these poor, wretched people, we have to protect right. them. Have you ever talked to those poor, wretched people? Maybe they don't want your, your protection. Maybe they're perfectly fine. There, there was this case in Portland where these women were interviewed saying, yeah, we went down to like Baja California. We were talking to these women, these Mexican women who were making these burritos and we bugged them. We were trying to get the recipe and they wouldn't give it to us. So we just watched them. And then we came and now we're doing that. They basically got shamed out of business. I would fault them only like, don't bug someone. The minute they tell you, you know, don't talk to me, whatever, but let them sell. And, and to me, what bothered me was this idea that Mexicans are victims always of cultural appropriation when we're doing it to ourselves. And again, Maybe these women knew that they were getting ripped off and they're fine. The best story I always tell on that was Taco Bell. Taco Bell was invented by Glenn Bell eventually, and he got his idea for selling Mexican food from this, this Mexican restaurant in San Bernardino that was right across the street from his hamburger and hot dog stand. And he admits this in his biography. Every night after closing up, he'd go across the street, get some tacos, try to decipher how to make them, go back to his kitchen and cook them. Eventually, the owner of this Mexican restaurant said, look, I know you're trying to rip off my tacos. If you're going to rip me off, at least do it right. Come into the kitchen, and I'll teach you. So that restaurant's named Meet La Cafe. This year, they're celebrating their 80th anniversary. I talked to the daughter-in-law of the, of the founder of Meet La Cafe, uh, Irene Montaño, and I asked her, was that story true about Glenn Bell? She's like, oh, yeah, we remember him. We would always make fun of this white kid trying to, you know, make Mexican food. And I told her, well, are you sad that Glenn Bell stole your family's heritage to make all like a billion dollar restaurant? I'll never forget her response. She's like, eh, good for him. You know, he's been around for 50 years. We've been around for 75 years. And besides, our tacos are better. Like, that's how you should see these things. Don't always try to cast Mexicans or ethnic people as poor, pathetic people. They're not. You're pathetic for uh, infantilizing them, for lack of a better term. Jonathan Gold died recently. Anthony Bourdain committed suicide recently. Um, is there something about being a food critic that is uh, uh, detrimental Lens to your filled. health? Yeah. Um, food critics, especially now, we're the truth tellers. We are the people who are saying it how it is, more so than any other beaten journalism. Yeah, you have investigative reporters. Yeah, you have this, this, and that. But we're telling you what people are eating. We're telling you what people are feeling. We're also showing, I mean, in some way, we're um, anthropologists in that we're talking about immigrant patterns. I've always said this. The first two businesses that an immigrant community always opens in the United States or wherever they go, they open up a place to worship and they open up a place to eat. And usually after the worship service, people start eating right there. So we're the ones who are telling you, is it a dangerous profession? I hope not. I'm a food critic. I, you know, I don't want to go anywhere yet.